G'day guys, in this video I'm going to be showing you how to find the world thickness h of this top and bottom world if there's a 2000 newton force acting on this assembly. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw a free body diagram of the world itself. And it'll look something like this. Now we know we're going to have a shear force acting on this thing, which I will call V. We're also going to have a bending moment about the x-axis, which I will call M. And we're also going to have another moment due to torsion about the positive z-axis, which I will call t. Now we can find the value of each of these things by using the sum of forces in all directions is equal to zero and the sum of moments in all directions is equal to zero. So that means v is going to be equal to 2000 newtons. We know that m is just going to be equal to 2000 times by the perpendicular distance, which in this case is 200 millimeters, and that will be equal to 400,000 Newton millimeters. And of course we know T can be found in a similar way. We know that's gonna be 2000 times by the perpendicular distance, which in this case is just 60, and that equates to 120,000 Newton millimeters. Now you might be asking, well, hey, shouldn't V actually be in the other direction and shouldn't M and T be in the other directions as well? Well, it, it really doesn't matter because this weld is not accelerating, nor is it rotating. So there's going to be an equal and opposite force on this thing and equal opposite moments as well. It's really just a matter of convention into which one you actually look at. And the book uses this type of notation where V is always going to be in the same direction as the force. But really, it doesn't matter. You can choose the other way if you like, and you'll get the same answer. Okay, well, let's consider the influences of shear stress due to each of these three things separately, and then we'll sum them all up towards the end. So let's first draw a free body diagram, which considers just the shear stress. In fact, let me make this a little bit bigger. Which considers just the shear stress. You're going to have a shear stress upwards, which means then that there will be, a sh the shear force is upwards, so the shear stress will also be upwards. And assuming that the shear stress is universally distributed across the world, that means it will look something like this. We also know that F, subscript s, this is a force per unit length right here, is going to be v on l, where l is your total length of your weld. And in this case, this can be simply, simply substituted, this is going to be 2000 divided by l, which in this case is 30 plus 30. That's the total length of your weld. So 30 plus 30. And when you evaluate that, it, it turns into a very nice number, 33.3 .3 newton per millimeter. Right now, usually that's not good enough. Usually we also want to clarify direction, right? So it's, it's in our interest to write this as a vector. So FS as a vector is actually 33.3 .3 upwards. So I'll write that as the J hat just there. It's in the positive Y direction. Now it's probably a good time to define my axis. So I'm defining Y as being positively upwards. I'm defining X as being positively this way, and Z is coming in this direction just here. So this is Z, X, and Y. So the I unit vectors are I, J, and K. Okay? All right, so now that the shear stress due to the shear force is done, let's deal with the shear stress due to the bending moment. So it'll look something like this. This is our free body diagram once more. Now, because of this... Because of this bending moment, you'll expect it to be pushing in on the top weld, but pulling out on the bottom weld. And we can express that graphically like this. I'll make that a little bit clearer. We can express that graphically like this. So it'll be pulling out at the bottom, but it'll be pushing at the top. That's due to this effect of this moment just here. And we can actually quantify this by saying that FB is actually just MY on IU. Right, and we we play the substitution game here. Now, I'm it, now it becomes necessary to define which point of the world you're dealing with, because depending on whether you're dealing with the top world or the bottom world, the value will be positive or negative. So let's say we're interested in evaluating this point here, which I will call point A. Right, this is just one point in the world. I'm just choosing to analyze um, just this point just here. So in this particular case for point A, Y will be the vertical distance from the center of mass of your world here to your point of your weld here, but it's the vertical distance, so that's just 25 millimeters. So Y is 25 millimeters. I subscript U can be found using first principles, so you can use moments of inertia and stuff like that, but you'll find it'll be easier to just use the tables provided. So here I've got, let me zoom out for you. Here I've got the tables, which contain all the information you need for calculating moments of inertia and stuff like that. 
So here is what, here's the one we're going to use. This right here refers to our weld. This is a standard top and bottom weld. And this right here is the second moment of area just here. BD squared on two, BD squared on two. So let's write that down. In this context, that will just be 30 times 50 squared divided by two, which is going to be 375 zero zero millimeters cubed. Notice it's millimeters cubed, not millimeters to the power of four. That's because FB is a force per unit length, not force per unit length squared. So if we plug all of this stuff in, we're left with the final solution. I'll just write it down for you. FB is in fact 266.7 newtons per millimeter. Now it's also convenient for us to define which direction it's in because we want to express this as a vector as well. So in fact, because this is in fact, in the negative z direction, it's, it's pushing away, right? That means then that this is going to be negative in the k hat direction. So that's because it's in the negative, uh, negative z direction. Let me just see if I can get this in the box. There we go. Okay, and I should have probably written units here. That's going to be newtons per millimeter. Just there, let's stick to that convention. Okay, well, now that that's done, let's consider the shear stress due to the torsion. That'll look something like this. Here's our free body diagram again. I think you're probably getting the hang of this right now. Now, this is probably the hardest one. Um, just imagine the influence this torsion has on this, on this assembly. As you'll imagine, it will have a tendency to produce a shear force in the XY plane, but it will be perpendicular to the distance from the centroid of your weld to your point of interest. So let's say we're dealing with this point. This will be the, the R vector, which means that our shear stress will in fact be in this direction. Likewise, in the center of the weld, it'll look like this. It'll look like this at point A. It'll look like this here. It'll look like this here. It'll look like this here. It's pretty tough to draw, but bear with me. Basically, I wanna say that it's, 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 per it's perpendicular to the distance from the weld to the centroid of the weld, if you know what I mean. Okay, so in this particular case, we can write F subscript J is gonna be equal to T R on J subscript W. Now, traditionally, this is only used for circular cross sections, but we can kind of fudge that and apply it for welds too. And um, now don't forget we're interested in point A here. So we're interested in this value of R. This right here is our value of R from the centroid of our welds to our point of interest on the weld. And we can find R using Pythagoras. That's just gonna be equal to the square root of, let's see, half this, which is 25 squared, plus half this, which is gonna be 15 squared. And what does that give you? That's gonna be 29.2 millimeters. Okay. And we already know T, we calculated it here. JW is a little bit interesting. Let's go back to the tables to solve that. Here's the table, I've already summarized it for you. Now, we don't have a perfect fit. We've got a top and bottom weld, but this is a side to side weld. How do we account for that? Fortunately, because we're dealing with torsion, this is just um, bending about the XY plane, it really doesn't matter whether this is to its side or top and bottom. It, it's, 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 it's all rotating about the Z axis. So basically, we can, we can account for this by replacing D for B and B for D and plug in this formula just here. So let me do that for you right now. In, when you plug in that formula, it's gonna be 30 times by three times 50 squared plus 30 squared, all divided by six. And when you plug that into your calculator, that's gonna be 42,000 millimeters cubed. Don't forget, it's millimeters cubed in this case because FJ is a force per unit length, okay? And when you plug that in, you're left with FJ, or at least the magnitude of FJ, is gonna be equal to 83.3 .3 newtons per millimeter. Now, that's not the most useful format we want this to be in. Because FJ in this case has a component in the X direction and a component in the Y direction, we need to split it into its X and Y components so that we can sum up the total shear stress. So that become, so it becomes necessary. So this is the direction it's acti acting out at the moment, just here. It becomes necessary to define an angle theta, which, it, which it's acting at from the vertical. It turns out from geometry that that angle here is also theta and, th and theta can be found using simple trig and theta is just inverse tan, inverse tan of 25 on 15 and you can plug that into your calculator. But basically you can split this into X and Y components 
and that becomes quite simple. That just means fj, the vector at least, is going to be equal to minus 71.43 in the x direction and minus 42.86 in the j direction. Okay, so there we go. That's all our vectors sorted. So it looks like we're almost ready to go. Um, we just need to sum all of these shear stress vectors in to get the total shear stress vector at point A. So let's do that. Let's scroll down really quick. There we go, we've scrolled down. So now we need to sum all of these vectors together. So we can write F subscript A as our total combined shear stress vector at point A as being the sum of all of these things. So it's gonna be the sum of the shear stress vector Fs plus Fb plus Fj. And when you sum all of that together, and I won't go through the algebra, it's really simple. You just sum up the i's, sum up the k's, sum up the j's, and you're gonna be left with minus 71.43, minus 9.56, and minus 266.7, just there. Now, the vector itself isn't what was really important. What was really important is the magnitude of the shear stress vector. We don't really care what direction it's in. We just wanna know what the magnitude is. So if we, take the magnitude of this vector, all we do is take the square root of each of these terms um, squared and added to each other. So it's gonna be the square root of 71 squared plus 9.5 squared plus 266 squared, right? Once you plug that into your calculator, what you're gonna be left with is 276.27 newtons per millimeter. So this is your total shear stress at point A. So it seems like we're almost done. It seems like we can just plug FA into our parallel loading formula and solve for H and we'll be done. But wait a second, it's worth considering whether this is actually the maximum shear stress acting on our weld. As it turns out, and I purposely chose this, as it, as it turns out, this point here, C, is where the maximum, is where our maximum shear stress will be. And you can tell that from common sense too, um, because at point C, that's where the Y component of your shear stress due to torsion adds with the Y component of your shear stress due to your shear force. So a little bit of common sense goes a long way and it's probably worth you really considering where the largest shear stress will be before you just calculate each of the vertices and just see which one's larger. Anyway, I'll shortcut the work for you, but basically if you do the same process, and it really won't take too long, if you do the same process for point C or point D, um, D is just this point just here, I should mention. D is just this point here. If you, if you do the same process for C or D, you're going to get an answer of 285.8 newtons per millimeter, right? And as, it, and as it turns out, this is where your largest shear stress will be, right? So this is the one which governs. So let me write this here. This is what governs. It governs because it's the largest possible value in our weld. Okay, so now that we know what's the largest force per, force per unit length that's going to be on the weld, let's use our parallel loading formula. So let's use our parallel loading formula. The main reason we use this formula is because at least one of our loads was parallel. Okay, so the formula states that FP is equal to SUH divided by three root two N right, where don't forget SU was just 410 megapascals, or if you like 410 Newton millimeters squared, and N was two, our factor of safety. And when you plug this in, this is really just high school maths, I won't waste too much time on it, but when you plug all this in with FP is equal to our, our governing load, right, that means H must be equal to 5.9 millimeters. This is the minimum um, thickness of our weld for this thing to hold. Now, we're done with this problem, and I hope that made sense, but what's really important to notice here is that this value could be quite far away from our ideal value of our thickness of our weld, and we determine that from looking at a final set of tables at the very end. But right now, this right here is what's really important, and if you got this value, congratulations, guys, you got the right answer.